Hello, everyone. Uh, it is my privilege to uh, moderate the next panel, which is with uh, five researchers from Cornell Cal's International Programs. And uh, I keep wanting to say five scientists, but there's one economist somehow snuck in to the group. Uh, so, so five researchers. And uh, I'm going to say their names and their departments right now and then introduce each of them as they go up in order. Uh, the first speaker will be Chris Barrett. I'll introduce him in a moment. Uh, Rebecca Nelson will follow. She's with plant pathology and plant microbiology. Uh, Mike Van Amberg is third up. After Mike is Johannes Lehmann. And finishing is Cy Rizvi. Uh, I'll introduce each in their turn. First, uh, Chris Barrett. Chris Barrett is the Stephen B. and Jane, Janice G. Ashley Professor of Applied Economics and Management at the Dyson School here at Cornell. And in January, he will become the director of the Dyson School, just announced. And he's also a professor in the Department of Economics, specializing in food systems. He has written about, I think, basically every topic in the encyclopedia, but specializes in food systems and rural development in Africa has published or has in press 14 books and more than 260 journal articles and book chapters while supervising more than 60 grad students and postdocs and raising five children. Think about that. Uh, <laughs> of course, Chris's claim to fame has yet to come. He will be a guest of The Daily Show sometime next week, so tune in for that. Chris. Thank you, John, for that uh, somewhat unnerving introduction. Uh, so I was asked to, to kick off, in part to set the stage for my colleagues' comments that will probe in a little bit more detail as perhaps appropriate to true scientists, since I just discovered <laughs> economics isn't a science. Uh, <laughs> but the, <laughs> But the, the, it's important to frame the problem initially, and then I'll offer you my perspective on, on how do we address the challenges we face. And as is necessary, given my union card as an economist, I'll frame this in demand side and supply side terms. So let me begin with the demand side, not least of which because this is, frankly, where we have the least leverage. So these are the things that we sort of need to take as given. And those are probably most easily summarized in the paragraph you see before you. That across a range of different expert projections, there's a, a pretty tight consensus in, in what we should expect over the, the coming 35 to 40 years. And that is that we're going to see significant population growth, 2 billion plus more people. Uh, we're going to see substantial urbanization across the world. And we're going to see significant income growth, hard as that might be to believe in the present economic situation in the US. The result is something on the order of a doubling of food demand facing the world. That's a really large number when you think about doubling food demand in 35 years. So why the key reasons are population growth. As a father of five, I can appreciate the challenges of feeding more people. Uh, that population will urbanize and urbanize pretty rapidly. We've only relatively recently as a world crossed the 50% threshold where now a majority of humans live in cities or broader metropolitan areas. But that's going to be up about 70% by 2050. And think about what that implies. It means that people are increasingly disconnected with primary production that increasingly people are on the far end of a delivery system that requires value chains stretching longer distances. That's an important challenge to keep in mind. Our laureates talked a little bit about the importance of infrastructure and value chains earlier. Income growth is relatively rapid in the developing world, two to three times the rate of the high income countries. By 2050, more than half of the world's output will be in today's developing countries. So the upshot of that is that more than 90% of the food demand growth we will see by 2050 will be in Africa and Asia. That is a really important number to keep in mind. 90% of the added food demand is going to be in Africa and Asia. Can we reduce demand significantly? Not really. 
It's relatively unlikely that we can appreciably change those numbers. There are a few things we can do that can take a little bit of the edge off the growth rates, but there's relatively little capacity to dramatically reduce consumer food waste in Africa and Asia, certainly. It's arguable how much you can do in the United States. The basic problem of food waste in the United States, frankly, is that food is inexpensive. But if food becomes expensive, we have a very different class of problems on our hands. So food waste goes hand in hand with relatively low cost food. Overconsumption in diets is something you can do a little bit about. I'll come back to that later. Rebalancing diets away from animal products. A little bit you can do, as everybody is aware. Animal products require far higher rates of, of primary grain and legume uh, production because of the inefficiencies intrinsic to the nutrition of animals. Uh, but it's a little bit unrealistic to believe we're going to have a vegetarian world. So uh, most modelers don't, don't take very seriously the idea that we'll get appreciable reduction in demand growth through dietary conversion. Finally, there's food biofuel competition that really does matter. Um, but very little of the future progress in biofuels production is likely to compete directly with foods. So when you add it all up, the best estimates coming out of the International Food Policy Research Institute, for example, which is probably the best modeling group on these sorts of questions, they estimate that you might be able to reduce demand growth by 5 to 10 percent maximum across all of these sorts of things. So we're not going to get appreciable change on the demand side except that we're going to need 70 to 100 percent more food by 2050. So that means we have to turn to the supply side. How are we going to get there? If we can't appreciably reduce the rate of growth in food demand, what's going to be the process by which we increase that food? Well, there are only three different approaches that are available. The first is you can expand inputs, or what's commonly referred to as extensification. The second is you can improve efficiency given the existing input use. Or the third is you can increase productivity, holding constant efficiency and in input use through the use of, of efficiency enhancing technologies. The first of those has very little prospect for helping out much for the simple reason that outside of Africa and Latin America, there is essentially no open land to use. And the idea that land in Latin America and Africa is open in the sense of unoccupied, unclaimed, has no productive use is clearly false. Lands that are presently uncultivated play important ecosystem preservation roles. They are sometimes reserves held in fallow or reserves for people, for grazing peoples, for example, in times of stress. And there are all sorts of issues around how you would allocate extensification across those lands. The possibility of expanding the area cultivated appreciably is pretty low, especially in Asia. But the really binding constraint is water. We already use 70% of the world's water for agriculture. In Africa and Asia, that's north of 80%. And with climate change, the stress is increasingly falling in the areas where the demand growth is greatest. So water is really going to be limiting unless we start discovering massive new reserves. Some of you may be aware of the, the finding announced yesterday in Kenya, a massive underground reservoir in one of the driest areas, Turkana in northwestern Kenya. If we have lots of these new aquifers discovered that are massive, maybe that problem will be relaxed. But I think that's a bit speculative. We shouldn't hang our hopes on this. And then marine capture fisheries don't offer us much room for expansion either. So when you add it all up, land, fresh water, and, and uh, saltwater resources simply don't have a great deal of room for expansion. The second claim we know a little bit less about, but most economists who've carefully looked at the efficiency of farm production find that once you control for environmental conditions, the, the inefficiency associated with farmer error is pretty low and also relatively untargetable. Now, that's not to say that there is not significant yield gaps. There are. But those are due to a variety of different things and not so much due to error inefficiency of the sort an economist would think about. Those are more due to incorrect germplasms available for the agroecological context, problems in water management, et cetera. So I'm going to lump improvements in those areas under the third category uh, that I'll come to in just a second. But the, the bottom line is that in, in Africa and Asia in particular, the, the waste in the sense of clearly foregone productivity using existing technologies 
appears relatively modest by most, most careful economic estimates, and that the remaining inefficiencies are pretty hard to target. So the punchline is technological change is absolutely essential. We heard that earlier today from Pedro, from Pear, from others. I mean, we simply have to improve the productivity of the existing stock of resources given farmers' capacities presently, and that's going to require radical improvements in how we manage land and water. Uh, in particular, I would argue water, and substantial increases, whoops, wrong direction, substantial increases in uh, plant and animal productivity uh, given, um, given improvements through technologies, whether it's genetic improvements or mechanical improvements in post-harvest processing, et cetera. The second biggest point that I want you to take away from this is that just as the growth in demand is happening in Africa and Asia, so does the growth in productivity have to happen in Africa and Asia for the simple reason that roughly 90% of the food consumed in the world is grown in the country in which it's eaten. That doesn't mean that global markets and trade don't matter. They matter enormously at the margin. They're the buffers that help us in times of shocks. Climate change adaptation depends crucially on effectively functioning global trade regimes and markets that can enable us to evacuate surpluses, windfall surpluses to areas suffering sudden deficits. But the workhorse of the food production and distribution system that will reach this increasingly urbanized global population is within the countries in which these increased Asians and Africans are going to live. So the productivity growth really has to focus in those parts of the world. Anything other than that is relying unreasonably on very long and rather expensive trade routes. Now this means that there are great opportunities ahead of us. And as someone who sits in an undergraduate applied economics and management program that trains a lot of young business leaders coming out of Cornell, you know, for my students, this means there is profit opportunity out there if you know how to manage this. If you can innovate in a way that helps the world, you can do well while doing good. And that's a pretty attractive combination. But that's going to require quite a few different things to support the private sector pushing productivity growth that really will reduce hunger and food insecurity around the world. The first is it requires, and Pear I thought made this point very eloquently this morning, it's going to require redoubled political commitment to investment in agricultural and natural resources management, research and development. We've simply become complacent, uh, especially within the G20 countries. We've become very complacent and expected that the miracles of the Green Revolution will continue that we no longer need to worry about how we're going to produce food for the next two billion people. That's got to change. There's too much basic science to be done, and in particular for productivity growth in Africa and Asia, for which there is not an abundant commercial farmer market for seed, for fertilizer, et cetera, it requires public investment to prime the pump in order to help with orphan commodities in particular. But the market signals that emerge from an increasingly urban market an increasingly better off, higher income market in Asia and Africa, and the crowding in effects that come from public investment in R&D will engineer significant private investment. There's a long track record of this. Agricultural R&D has increased dramatically over the past 10 years in the private sector. It's in the public sector that it's come down dramatically. And the problem is the private sector investment is shorter horizon than the more basic research in the public sector. The public sector research is what sets the table for progress 15 to 25 years down the road. The private sector research is what takes care of problems in the three to 10 year window, i.e. within the horizon of patents where you have intellectual property protection through which you can recover your investments. Trade is going to be absolutely essential, especially in response to increasingly dramatic and frequent climate fluctuations. And the big problem here is, frankly, the OECD agricultural programs. You know, we spend more than a billion dollars a day in the high income countries supporting domestic agriculture. The protection rates are dramatically higher in agriculture than they are in energy or manufacturers. And that creates a very tilted playing field. And it creates significant disruptions in global markets. That's one thing we can fix actively. In addition to investing in ag R&D, we can invest actively in improving the trade regimes and in reducing the imbalance in the trade regimes due to our own domestic farm support programs. Finally, sustainability-oriented marketing 
where you start to see firms that realize that there is money to be made by helping to educate people about healthy, sustainable, and just food production systems. There's a growing body of evidence that people are willing to pay a premium to know that their purchases are helping small farmers or helping farm workers to earn just wages, are being used to support production that is environmentally sustainable, et cetera. Tapping that market that people like you and me are commonly willing to pay that premium requires marketing. It requires some of those business skills that enable firms to educate consumers about the nature of their food choices, to verify that these claims are truthful, and then to extract from us that premium we're willing to pay to make the food systems work in a more just and sustainable fashion. It's doable. People are doing that right now, but we're not doing it at scale yet. That's very much the future, I think. So there are abundant opportunities, but there are also threats, because there are good reasons to believe that we're not going to succeed in all these areas. In particular, I remain somewhat skeptical about the willingness of major governments to step up and deal with farm program reform, trade reform, and to make major investments in ag R&D for Africa and Asia, as opposed to just for their own farmers. And if we fail to do that, there are some pretty grave consequences that may be ahead. The most obvious that we've already seen since 2007, 8 is higher and substantially more volatile food prices with all the attendant risks that runs. Risks it runs in particular for hungry people who struggle to feed their families. But another important risk is, is the risk of increased socio-political instability. Uh, I have a book coming out. There will be a, a chat in the stacks at Mann Library in mid-November featuring Wendy Wolford from Development Sociology and Susan McCooch from Plant Breeding and a few of our graduate students who, with the two of us and, and 15 others, authored a suite of chapters in this Oxford University press book that's coming out later this month, Food Security and Sociopolitical Stability. The punchline of that is that we're in a world that's growing increasingly dangerous if we don't get around to attending to the necessary investments in improving food security by boosting food productivity, especially in Africa and Asia. And not least of which, and the area where I'm least confident we're going to address these problems appropriately in the near term, is the degradation of natural resources. We're still borrowing far too much from our grandchildren, and we have a lot of work to be done to fix that. So just to summarize, in the past, the Green Revolution and prior innovations, the development of hybrid corn in the United States, which predated the Green Revolution, other sorts of innovations have been enormously important to stimulating economic growth, poverty reduction, and improvements in human standards of living throughout human history, but especially over the past century. It's clear that food systems have the potential to really reduce human suffering, and it's a challenge that can be met, but it requires serious commitment commitment of political leadership and political will, commitment of real dollars by the private sector as well as the public sector. Structural demand and supply patterns pose really significant challenges. There's relatively little, little we're going to be able to do to significantly attenuate rapid growth in food demand as people begin to reside more in cities, demand more complex animal-based diets, and just begin to have an adequate diet. And if we don't meet those challenges, we face a whole host of, of, of different threats. The key thing to take away, though, is we can't think about this as just a global problem. It has very specific geographic parameters. We must focus on these problems in Africa and in Asia above all. If we just look at it as America will feed the world, we will fail. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Chris Barrett, and I deeply apologize for delisting economics from <laughs> the roster of the, the sciences <clears throat> chastened. Uh, our next speaker is uh, a plant scientist, Rebecca Nelson. Uh, Rebecca Nelson is a professor of plant pathology and plant microbiology, plant breeding and genetics, and international agriculture and rural development. You would think I would have memorized her by now. Um, her lab works on the genetics of disease resistance in maize. She's also scientific director of the McKnight Foundation's collaborative crop research program, which works in Africa and South America. Uh, she's currently on the leadership council of the United, States, uh, United Nations Sustainable Development Solutions Network, 
that's developing guidelines to replace the Millennium Development Goals. And full disclosure, uh, she married me <laughs> at one point uh, 25 years ago. How do I manage this? Okay. Afternoon. Thank you. Thanks, Johnny. Chris. Uh, <laughs> so I appreciate the panel. Uh, the organizers giving me the chance to put in the, a crop perspective here. Um, so if we look back on crop production over the last uh, 100 years, we've made this transition from a, a, a state in which people and their animals provided the labor and the, and the fertilizer and developed the crops and managed the water for farming to one where in, in modern agriculture, it's largely machines. I mean, people are there too, but um, we have uh, mechanization to do a lot of the work and fertilizer to bring in the nitrogen. We have crops bred by plant breeding professionals that can use that nitrogen efficiently and water's again handled by machines. And so we've uh, replaced a lot of the variability with inputs. We sort of optimize this relatively simple form of farming and it's, it's worked great. We have, so we've had, this guy here on the left, who figured out how to pull nitrogen out of the air and put it into the, into the soil with fertilizer, and the guy on the right who figured out how to plant, make plants that could capitalize on that. Uh, and now as a result, we have a cow there that used almost 300 gallons of uh, oil in its, in its lifespan, and you know the Brazilian, as you heard, I'm sure, earlier today, uh, the Br Brazilian Cerrado with that phalanx of of tractors moving across it, and it's worked great. We've had fabulous improvements in productivity, but also huge improvements in inputs, um, nitrogen, water, and phosphorus inputs, and, and uh, pesticides as well. And so we're starting to see the downsides of some of those inputs. And they haven't been quite fairly distributed either. Over on the right, you have the Netherlands to topping the list, but there's, you know, you are here, the, USA there somewhere. And here down at the left-hand side, this is um, kilos per hectare of fertilizer input. You have um, Mali, uh, Niger, Uganda, Mozambique. So Africa hasn't been enjoying, you know, they don't even get on the, on the chart here. Um, haven't, hasn't been enjoying some of the wonders of, of that uh, input approach. Um, and there are other downsides as well. Uh, this is uh, increase in productivity over the years of the Green Revolution. Um, well, data from mostly from South Asia uh, that Ross Welch uh, gave me. Uh, and you can see that population, world population, developing country population is about doubled during that interval. And um, cereal production was able to keep pace, but legume production really fell behind and wasn't able to keep pace. So legumes were the, are the crop group that, that traditionally did, they brought that nitrogen out of the air into the soil, but they also brought carbon out of the air and into the soil. And synthetic nitrogen doesn't do that. Uh, so it also doesn't provide uh, oil and uh, protein to people the way that legumes can. So you see some dietary, some sustainability issues coming in there with this approach. And uh, so, so the, the various sustainability problems are somewhat coming home to roost. And we figure, okay, I think there's a general feeling that we don't want to keep or romanticize pre modern agriculture particularly, and it's still quite dominant in many parts of the world. Um, and there are downsides to modern agriculture. There's a lot of you know, impressive things about it, but it's sort of time for us to reconstruct what it, or, or to invent this postmodern agriculture. So what's it gonna look like? Well, insofar as the modern agriculture is this optimized simplicity based on cheap oil, then uh, I'm thinking, Postmodern agriculture would be optimized complexity based on cheap information. So drawing on some of that ecological information that's used in pre-modern agriculture, as well as some of the tricks of the trade and some of the efficiencies and um, properties of modern agriculture as well, some of the, te the technologies that Chris mentioned. So um, how are we gonna do that? Well, um, just like these women are unlikely to transit through via uh, modern agriculture to postmodern agriculture, you know, they're, they're all packing a cell phone, all these ladies, and they'll be able to get in on some of this um, information revolution, hopefully. So we gotta invent that. So when we think about inventing this new agriculture, sometimes the debate is framed in this country as some sort of a you know, tug of war between the organic proponents and the import-oriented people. And uh, my co-conspirators and I, who favor a more agroecological approach to intensification, um, 
don't find that a particularly useful dichotomy and sort of think about improving the performance of agricultural systems in terms of productivity and various other outcomes that we desire through the integration of ecological principles into farm and system management. So that'll look really different depending on who you are. There's, that's not a one size fits all sort of an approach. So I've divided farms here into the, in the simplest way I can think of uh, between poor market access and good market access on the one axis and then low resource endowment and high resource endowment. So, uh, and I'm thinking, okay, if you divide up people into those four simple groups, of course there's an infinite array and that's ludicrous simplification, but there's really different things. So one thing is we wanna improve market access, both input and output market access for the, those that have poor market access, improve their market access, and then generally improve the assets from the left to the right as well. In terms of inputs, that's pretty different. This group um, needs to improve their in input efficiency. And for example, um, in China, it's, you, you can, it's been shown that you can double corn production just by improving the timing and placement of nitrogen. So you don't have to Im increase nitrogen input to double productivity in that system just by you know, using models and um, modernity to, to improve efficiency can be extremely um, effective and then you don't have so much pollution from your nitrogen if you're using it efficiently. And in this, um, those who have poor market access and low resources, they're gonna need to bring in more inputs. They need more technology. In those depleted systems, in general, it's agreed that you know, they can use agroecology, but only if, generally, if they, they get some fertilizer in there as well, for example. But if you include legumes in your system, you can get much more value for that a small amount of fertilizer you may be able to afford to put in, for example. So you want to combine um, modernity and pre -modern, or post, into postmodernity, whatever. So anyway, we, in, in general, the inputs aren't just chemical inputs here. They're, they're knowledge, they're ecological knowledge, they're biological processes, for example. So I'm, a, I'm sort of in the pest area, and I can say that there are actually very kind of Maybe the estimates are wild, but the numbers are wild, what those estimates are that are involved in losses. And there are some very impressive ecological pest management systems. This is the famous push-pull system where uh, Desmodi, this, this intercrop and companion crops very effectively manage the pest complex that takes down the corn system in Kenya, and those companion crops are good fodder for a crop livestock integrated system. You know, this scary looking one, that's the good guy, effectively controlling that cute one, which is the, actually the pest. Um, so if you design your field or your ecosystem, you can get the um, positive uh, biological interactions to keep your pests under control with biopesticides. You can just solar heat your beans and don't have those six huge famous losses post-harvest. Um, so anyway, uh, how are we doing? Are we, how are we set up to create this postmodern revolution? Um, b badly, I would have to say. Um, one dimension of it might be to, to go for a more precision approach to agriculture. If you think of an axis in which the extreme here is precision agriculture where you're getting it right um, meter by meter in a very heterogeneous environment versus a national blanket recommendation where you're just doing the same thing across the whole of Ethiopia irrespective of its vast heterogeneity. Um, what are we doing? Well, actually, the current practice is to do a few rinky-dink experiments in irrelevant parameter space and give a national recommendation. Sorry, you know, everybody knows it's idiotic, particularly the farmers know it's idiotic. Um, you know, whether you use high-tech or low-tech precision, um, you really have to get, get it right. So this idea of AEI would be providing the concepts and principles and then supporting people to figure out in situ what they need to do in particular. And that would be quite a huge transformation. It's my, I spend most of my time supporting national programs to do better research and I tell you we've got a long way to go. We need what Chris says of the greater investment um, and a transformative investment to make that better. Um, so this is my, what I think we need to get there. So I'd, um, so we're trying to reduce the risk and carbon footprint of agriculture and to produce, I, I tried to wedge in an update that included productivity, thinking of Chris's basic take home message, improve new productivity and nutrition through AEI. To do that, we're gonna need to build the evidence base for it. After decades of work on industrial, industrialized modern agriculture, we have good evidence base, it works great. Ecological agriculture doesn't particularly work great generally, so we need a lot of ecological information across diverse contexts, and then to be able to turn that into viable options to fit farmers' very multifaceted and uh, different contexts. 
And the current system, as I argued, you know, is not really very well willing to or set up to do that. So, but there's this huge and wonderful opportunity to shift to more democratized um, approaches to research and development. This will take investment, but there's, I think, a lot of excitement around that to make a more crowdsourcing uh, participatory approach to research. Um, and then just my one last comment is besides that, I think we need a different outlook. I think many of us have probably seen Hans Rosling's brilliant little four minute Gapminder video. And it, the crescendo is that we're gonna go ever upwards towards greater wealth and greater health. And I don't think that's the, really the right image to leave in our minds. If we think of having you know, the sector, the big sector that has not enough, there's some people with enough and then a lot of people have too much, arguably. We need to have a different idea, I think, converging towards the, the sustainable enough rather than always having to have, we don't want to have always more meat, more nitrogen. We want to have the right amount of meat, the right amount of nitrogen, uh, which for a lot of people means more and a lot of people means less. Okay, thank you. Our next speaker representing the animal kingdom. Animals are a kingdom. I don't want to get this wrong again. Is that, <laughs> they're not like a genus or something. I, uh, okay, uh, is Mike Van Amberg. Mike Van Amberg is a professor in the Department of Animal Science at Cornell. His recent work focuses on uh, the diets and digestive systems of dairy cattle. He also leads the development of the Cornell Net Carbohydrate and Protein System, which is used worldwide to enhance nutrient use efficiency by ruminants and improve the environmental impact of animal uh, food production. In addition to his teaching and his research, he leads the Cornell Dairy Fellows Program and serves as advisor for the Dairy Science Club. Mike. So, that's fine. All right, so thank you for allowing me to be here, Sarah and John, and we had a little bit of a, a previous discussion about what we should be set up to do. I'm the cow guy. I feel like the token animal scientist in a group of plant people, uh, which is not always a friendly place to be, I can tell you. Um, not for the plant people, that's not the problem. Um, but those that don't understand animals. But I was told to leave my, my science behind somewhat and be the philosopher. So I'm going to do a little bit, this is what I call animal science light, uh, but thinking about uh, the future. And I, you know, I'm gonna preface this by a few things. What's the future of animals? Well, I study cows, I study ruminants, I study sheep, you know. From my perspective, and ruminants are the ultimate recyclers, all right? And we can have a big discussion. I saw the 300 barrels of oil. I'm still trying to do the math in my head about how much energy that is because I think you're saying that anything that grew on the ground that was green counted in that, and that's probably not entirely fair because that's a misperception. That means that we put that into the animal, not that she harvested it. So I will take a little bit with you about that. <laughs> um, but, but when we look at the diets of cows, and I'll come back to this, cows eat a lot of things, a lot of the things that we can't eat, all right? And I'm gonna come back to that. But they also, and I'm a cow guy, so I'll, I'll focus on dairy, but they're also a really good source of essential nutrients, especially for children and older adults. They make use of land that's not good for other crops. There's a lot of land out there that we can't grow things on, but we'll grow some form of a forage or grass or something. That's a great way to reduce food security. There's a lot of land in New York that we don't use that could put a lot of sheep or small ruminants on. Um, we make use of byproducts from the human food production. There's a lot of feedback there, I'll stand back here. And I think the future is we have to look at indigenous resources. There's a lot of discussion about Africa. I have not been to Africa. I've been to India and China quite a bit. Um, and I'll refer to that a little bit before I'm done. So, um, you know, I think maybe I will tell you up front that it's probably not a good idea to grab a bunch of Holsteins and plop them down in the middle of Africa and expect that they're going to do really well. All right. But there's a lot of goats and small ruminants there that do, would do really well and they need to be enhanced. I'll briefly discuss that. Risks, we've heard this all day long. Uh, education, training, workforce. All right, how are we gonna educate people? How are we gonna help them understand what the real biology is? How do we help them understand how to manage to optimize the biology of the plants and the animals and the things that we're gonna give to those uh, that we're gonna use? Resources and infrastructure, we've heard this. 
Failure to recognize, and I'm glad everybody's doing this, failure to recognize, accept productivity as a solution and adopt technologies. Um, Pedro, you made a comment earlier today, and I would love to take a poll here, but I don't have time, maybe during the question and answer. If nobody was here at that point, Pedro said, I want to, and Pear Anderson took a problem with that. He said, I want to triple production, okay? Or yield. All right, so what if I stood here and said, I want to triple the yield of a dairy cow? You would say, fine. I think I can do it. There's a lot of people that would say that's not right, right? So why do we differentiate if he says it's okay to triple the yield of a wheat plant, that I can't say it's okay to triple the yield of an animal? Because there seems to be a real issue in society with that perspective. Okay, and that's one of the things as an animal scientist I'm constantly fighting. There we go. And so I think that there's a little bit of a double standard personally between animals and plants. That it's okay for plants, but we don't want to do that to animals because it causes stress or problems or things of that nature. So I will bring that up because I see that as a risk. And then obviously political stability and inability to engender appropriate working capital. Um, I think there's places in the world that we are starting to see capital investment, uh, like China, at least in, in some areas, but uh, how that gets used is still a problem. So I think there's no, you know, and, and you did make the point about how much, I think that's right. How much do we need to feed? How many of these nutrients do we need to feed to children or growing kids? And, and um, Roger made a point wherever he is. That was an excellent. I really enjoyed that because um, I, I saw a little bit of that at one point in my life and, and it does stick with you. So we need to figure out how to get animal source foods into children. They need it. There's no discussion about the fact that we know that that's important. Uh, we know, you know, well, we can talk about no food. Roger's example was basically no food, not just animal source food. But we know if we don't get the right nutrients into children, poor growth, impaired cognitive performance, you know, deficits, psychiatric disorders, um, high mortality rates. I'm going to try and stand up here and see if I can do it. You know, we can come up with this list of calories and nutrients here. You know, if we look at uh, dairy product contribution to U.S. intake, I'm going to use the U.S. simply because it was easy for me to find this data. Uh, percent of calories, about 10 percent, but 58 percent of our vitamin D, our calcium, 28 percent of our vitamin A, our potassium, you know, we can go right through the list here. We want to put meat into that. Now we're talking about iron, which is a real problem around the world. I know plant scientists are trying to figure out how to change that and put um, nutrients into places where we can get that without animal products, and I think that's a real positive. One of the questions that I did hear this morning, though, and I want to bring this up, is about the climate aspect, because I, I am constantly being bombarded by the cows and the animals are destroying the world with methane and CO2 and all this kind of stuff. I fully disagree with that, and we can talk about why that is. Every food has an environmental impact. Nothing is free. The question is, is how many nutrients do we get per unit of environmental impact? All right, and I think that's the one lesson or the one point that I want to make here is that I'll use milk because I think that's the best one. This came out of a paper by Smedman. Um, milk, 53.8, and you can read how they did nutrient density. 99 grams of CO2 per equivalents per gram of product, orange juice. You can see the drop off in nutrient density. I do like a lot of other fermentation end products, so I'm gonna drink my fair share of red wine and beer. Uh, you see beer's way down here at the bottom. Doesn't put out a lot of CO2, but it really isn't worth much uh, in terms of nutrient density. But notice where milk ranks, you know? And this came about because Denmark, I think it was Denmark, wanted to remove milk from school lunches because they thought it was just, just a big environmental impact. And somebody said, well, if you look at it per unit of nutrient density, it looks pretty darn good. So instead of just looking at a product and saying this is a bad thing, let's look at it from how we feed the world because I think this is much, a much better way of doing it. I'm also quantitative. He mentioned the model. We're getting to the point now, this is a little bit of my research, or, or how we think about it. We're getting to the point now where we can actually tell you how many grams of CO2 and how many grams of methane per unit of dry matter intake, per unit of milk, per unit of byproduct that a cow's producing immediately upon formulation of the diet. 
So anywhere, anywhere in the world that you can want to formulate a diet for a cow, we can do this. So we can actually get an immediate feedback on, is this an environmentally friendly diet or not? And if it is, great. If it isn't, you have the alternative to change it. So, and I think this is, again, the way we need to start thinking about things. We can't just say cows are bad, this is good, or animals are bad, this is good. We have to look at input-output relationships. And that's just a picture of the model. But I think that is one of the things that I've run into as I go around the world, is we're not very good at other places of the world at quantifying, modeling the inputs and outputs of the system. And Chris made a point about this. There's very extravagant models out there about systems. We've started to model this. We're starting to model the farm. I have a couple of colleagues that we keep talking about how we do this. Again, it's a resource thing. We need some money to be able to put this all together. But I think the better we do, with this modeling effort and quantifying the inputs and outputs, the better the decision making. This is a land use question. If I told you where this is, which I'll do in a minute, does that look like good land? Can we grow a lot of crops up on those hillsides? Probably not. Where do you guys think this is? How about Tuscany? All right, and you would say, well, that's a pretty privileged place. Well, that's marginal land. What did they do a couple thousand years ago with marginal land? They put some sheep on it, and they now make pecorino. I think this is probably one of the opportunities that's a premium product, right? But it's just a really good example. We don't think of Tuscany as marginal land, but it really is. Right? They figured out a way to turn it into something that was really useful. I think a model like this, as a systems thinker, a model like this actually isn't a bad idea for thinking about some of these other areas that have a little bit of a problem with uh, a quality of land. You know, this has all been talked about. The one thing that I always come back to that I made the point when I started is that the majority, you now we're gonna have all these people, and I, you know, the majority of the basic food supply for humans is gonna continue to be plant-based. But we can't eat everything. Not everything that we harvest, we can eat. Not everything that we process has things that are left over that are any good for us. There's lots and lots of byproducts. There's a couple points about this. One, they're not free. This is basically how some of these industries pay for or add value to the production for human food. This is one way that we make food cheaper, right? Soy hulls are not cheap. Peanut meal, linseed meal, all this stuff after oil extraction. You know, we don't grow soybeans directly to feed cattle. We feed or chickens or pigs. We grow soybeans to make oil. We sell the byproduct, right? And that's true of all of these things. Ethanol production you know, would basically fail if you couldn't sell the distiller's grains. All right? So there's a, that byproduct is useful. And actually, by feeding that to a cow or a pig or a chicken, we reduce the environmental impact of human food production wherever you want to go in the world. Okay? So I think we also have to recognize that animals do a, a, another part of this process of helping us with all of these plant byproducts by turning them into high quality nutrients. The almond board does a great job. This is my best example. How many almond hulls do they produce every year in the state of California? About four billion pounds. Okay, is that a lot? That's just one, that's just almonds. Everybody like almonds? How do we dispose of four billion pounds of almond hulls? We feed them to cows, all right? But that gives you some idea of, of the size of this problem in an industrialized system. My point about indigenous, again, I don't think, you know, if we're going to talk about Africa, we're not going to take Holsteins and plop them down in the middle of Africa and expect them to do really well. But we can go into Africa, we can look at some of these goats that have really good disease resistance and have kind of evolved in that system, and we can figure out how to make them better. And this is one of the other opportunities that I think we have that we really haven't considered as much as we should. Uh, I've got some friends, there's a couple Cornelians, there's Kurt Van Tessel, uh, who's a Cornell grad, and our new, uh, right here, is our new faculty member in animal science, Heather Houston, she's a genomic specialist. Uh, they've been over there working on this. I think this is a fantastic project, because we're gonna take a local resource, back to the idea of local versus of uh, global, and we're gonna improve the ability of that resource to be productive within the system, all right? Some conversations, and this is one of the things that bothers me. You can look at this. Uh, this is uh, CareerCast, Worst Jobs of 2013, number six on the list is a dairy farmer. 
Um, this bothers me when I see this because somebody earlier asked the question to the uh, journalist, how do we make agriculture sexy again? And it's really hard. It's a lot of work, right? I would like to figure out how to, as somebody who my entire job is based on teaching people how to go back into the industry or how to go out and figure out how to produce food, when this is the reinforcement that you get, it makes it kind of difficult, right? But this is also a bigger problem, I think, around the world because as we get better at producing food, it's harder and harder to attract people to do that. This just happens to be a US perspective, all right? This happens in other places. This was one of my China examples. Uh, this is the, uh, anybody familiar with the China 500 gram dairy intake declaration by Wen Jiabao that was uh, published, I got it out of the China Daily in 2008. So I'm over in China on, on behalf of the Chinese government and the FAO. I've got a couple colleagues with me. Uh, this is a barn. What should you expect to see here? Should be some cows. Why aren't the cows there? Well, they packed these stalls with such fine sand that it was kind of like cement, and the cows said, I don't want to live there. All right, is that a problem? Well, it's a problem because they invested lots and lots of money into this program and they never really taught anybody how to do anything, right? So back to food security, not only are they investing all these resources in this facility, they never taught them how to make use of it, right? Got another example. Um, you'll see anybody who's milked a cow will see something that's missing in this picture. What do you see that's missing? There's not an udder there, is there? Yeah, there's an udder, there's no udder, there's an udder. Yeah, no training. They were milking heifers that had not calved. Some of these heifers weren't even pregnant. But on the calendar, it said they were supposed to be milked after this date, right? Because they had had a service, assuming that they got pregnant. But the bottom line is, you know, so the woman from the FAO is following me in this parlor, and we're trying to sort this out. And she says, what's wrong? I says, well, you know, you, I don't know how much money you guys invested in here, but you better take these people and go train them actually what a cow is and why it should work this way. Uh, but I think this is a really big risk because we talk about food security, but we never really think about what this means long term. You know, we put this infrastructure in place, we spend all this money, we do all these resource allocations, and we never get the people up to speed about how they actually should be doing this. All right, and this to me, I've been over there a few times to try and help this. I think we're making some progress, but uh, it's a heavy battle because these guys, they're great guys, fun to drink with. Uh, they're really good at that, um, but it's hard to educate them because they don't have any base education. They don't understand any, any fundamental physiology of the cow. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Our fourth speaker of five uh, today represents uh, the soil. Johannes Lehmann is professor of soil biogeochemistry and soil fertility management here at Cornell. During the last uh, 10 years, he's focused on nanoscale investigations of soil organic matter, the biogeochemistry of black carbon and sequestration in soil, and sustainable land management practices in tropical agriculture. He has authored more than 150 journal publications and is a member of several editorial boards. Johannes. There you are. I want to focus on soils, fully recognizing that there's a whole suite of other discussions and I'm trying to stay out of economics, even if I touch a little bit on the side um, uh, with, with various aspects. Uh, soils are a fragile thing, as we all know. Uh, it can be beautiful to look at some of the soil degradation problems, as you see here. Maybe it makes a good poster um, in your living room, uh, but that's, of course, an agroecological disaster. Uh, a little less dramatic and um, uh, visually striking is soil degradation that occurs uh, everywhere. Uh, this is an example from uh, East Africa, where soil organic matter losses um, are a time bomb that we're sitting on, uh, where soils continue to degrade, and uh, we can predict that uh, soil fertility and uh, crop productivity will continue to decrease if we don't have any countermeasures. Um, if you take one parameter that you want to want to look at um, to evaluate at a given site soil fertility dynamics, it's probably soil carbon um, that we need to worry about. 
all the more enlightening is really uh, this kind of assessment. This is in the context of climate change mitigation, uh, but it's very instructive. Um, and uh, you'll see that um, the, uh, uh, there were scientists asked from around the country how they judge uh, the uh, scientific certainty of the change in soil carbon with various management. Among it, a switch to no-till, um, but also other conservation tillage uh, measures, and you'll see that we have uh, estimates that are based on 250 peer-reviewed publications that could be used for this estimate, but still the scientists consider our uh, certainty as medium, and, and then it goes um, down from there uh, to other conservation tillage measures as low. So what's, what's wrong here? Uh, 250, do we need 500 papers to have certainty? Uh, uh, What's, what's, the, what's the story? Well, there's, there's something uh, wrong and right about that. Um, here you see the average um, in, expressed here as, as CO2 equivalents because it's in a climate change realm. Um, but uh, there's a, a, an average increase of, um, um, of carbon sequestration, uh, but the error bars are much larger than the, uh, uh, than the average. So that that doesn't say really uh, there's a problem with uh, uncertainty. There's maybe just uh, a high variability. So there, I think what the message must be is that there's no one size fits all. Uh, this is an example from Zambia uh, using conservation agriculture um, in, uh, across an, a large, wide environmental gradient. And the same happens. You find areas where a set of uh, management instructions work, and in other areas it doesn't. Um, and we need to fully account for that. That's, that echoes a little bit also what, uh, what Rebecca was saying before. Um, so so really, we shouldn't confuse uncertainty with uh, what I think is and should be and will be uh, predictable variability. Um, and uh, uh, we, we know about nutrient management for, for a long time. Uh, Justus Liebig here 150 years ago uh, taught us um, a, a lot about it. Um, and uh, we surely have quite a bit of insight. Um, I call that the, the box problem that soil scientists face very often. Um, it's, it's very difficult, or I see it as uh, not easy, or, or would uh, claim that, that I'm, I'm, uh, um, I'm uh, uh, a little bit disappointed sometimes in, in soil scientists when they communicate, and of course, present company uh, excluded, um, uh, how they, how they communicate, communicate what, what the soil potential is, what the soil management potential is, because it doesn't come really in a neat box. It doesn't come as a, a miracle rice that we can, that we can spread. Um, it, it is a, a nuanced and, and very site-specific uh, instructions how to manage uh, soil. So we need, to, we need to find a ways of, of uh, bringing a, a soil box that we can untie, and we have tools in there to give instructions on how to manage soils uh, best. Um, going back to, uh, to Justus Liebig and nutrients, um, we know that fertilizers, and that's maybe the closest we get to a box uh, that we can put on the table and say, here, take it, um, and, and you'll be happy with it. Um, but, but even that, as Rebecca mentioned earlier already, we have blanket recommendations for fertilizers uh, across uh, one country that, that um, uh, are, are bound to fail. Um, so also there, we need to account for this variability and give uh, the management instructions to do that. Um, but I'll, I'll move on from here on the nutrients. Um, there are, of course, nutrients and phosphorus is the example here that come from the soil they, or from the geological uh, strata. They are mined, um, and that means they're exhausted. Some estimates say that by 2030 we come to peak phosphorus. Um, the industry thinks it's another 100 year out. Uh, it's clear that it's a non-renewable resource, um, and we have, to, uh, we have to make provisions for that. So we need to find ways of dealing with that. Um, especially interesting, I find always these kind of data um, uh, that uh, show how short-changed Africa is on the phosphorus, having the greatest phosphorus resources, uh, especially in Morocco, and getting almost nothing. Um, most of the phosphorus is exported from Africa uh, to feed our agriculture, to feed European agriculture. Uh, almost nothing goes into the 
um, African agriculture, and then through to um, the food um, uh, in, in, in diet. Uh, so that's, that's, I think, uh, a big problem. Uh, but it's, there, there are, of course, opportunities um, that not only in Africa, um, but anywhere. And that echoes um, what the students had said this morning, which I um, tremendously enjoyed. Um, I think there are opportunities. We have to look at, at recycling, uh, not only um, as, a, as a poor man's or woman's uh, choice um, and, and only help, but uh, also in our societies here, we have to look at recycling um, and figure out how we can get nutrients back uh, into the value chain and not um, dump into, uh, into aquifers or, or into landfill. Um, so we have to figure out um, how, we, how we can get uh, human excreta back. Uh, toilets are, are one uh, issue that separate uh, urine from feces. Uh, we have to see that we can get um, food processing uh, byproducts back into the value chain. Um, and rough back on, of the envelope calculations uh, tell us for Ethiopia, for instance, that uh, slaughterhouse wastes um, from, uh, from meat processing, uh, the phosphorus in those wastes are on the order of magnitude uh, that uh, the phosphorus import for Ethiopia is. So finding ways of recycling um, phosphorus uh, from food wastes uh, and human excreta can make a big difference, uh, and I think we need to make uh, uh, use of that. So my take-home messages are uh, we need to cast uh, the net widely. We, need to, uh, we can't stop at the farm gate for all kinds of examples, whether it's carbon or nutrients. Um, we need to secure those resources with state-of-the-art technology, uh, and we need to develop knowledge systems. Uh, knowledge systems, and, and Rebecca talked a bit about the, the, that dichotomy of, of uh, uh, knowledge and technology intensive uh, versus um, uh, the, the very rough and, and dirty. Um, and there is a, a middle way, but I, I do think, and, and want to nuance that a little bit, I do think uh, that it will always be a knowledge intensive uh, system, and, and I think we need to go uh, that technology route to harness uh, those, those benefits. Um, I think there are uh, uh, initiatives on the way to forge alliances, to building platforms, um, and only through those large platforms that are knowledge intensive and that provide the infrastructure for these knowledge intensive um, uh, management systems we, we can deliver in the future. Thank you very much. And uh, last speaker before we uh, have a discussion here represents food science. So what happens after? production and before consumption, I guess. Um, Cy Rizvi is a professor of food process engineering in Cornell's Department of Food Science and also holds the title of international professor. He's interested in engineering and processing aspects of food science and value addition for global markets. He's published over 150 technical papers, co-authored or edited six books, and uh, holds six patents. He was selected as a Jefferson Science Fellow and served as a senior science advisor at the State Department in Washington. Sai. Uh, first of all, uh, before I get started, I'd like to take a moment and uh, congratulate uh, International Program of the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences for 50 wonderful years of making contribution to uh, food and agriculture worldwide. Uh, and thank you for including me in part of your, as part of your celebrations. So, going backward. Okay, so my um, take on this is uh, food for the future. Uh, and how do we build a new food system that will address this issue? And I'd like to begin by sharing some thoughts that I have coming from outside of agriculture in the beginning. I really captured you know, some of these facts that are very intriguing. When I looked at this map, which is uh, produced by the world map, and if you look at the darker blue, uh, shaded area, these are uh, the agriculture as, and value added product as percent of GDP. So the more than 15% of GDP depends on agriculture, look at those countries and if you superimpose on that uh, from uh, uh, the FAO a map which shows that where is the prevalence of undernourishment is more than 15% to up to more than you know almost 100%, you'll see they are superimposable. They're literally, each map can be superimposed. So what is the message? The more you depend on agriculture, the more undernourished and poverty-stricken you are. And if I impose third map on this, 
which says that, you know, how many, what was the prevalence of people making less than $2 a day, there'll be another map that can be superimposed. So then uh, immediately the question comes, does agriculture perpetuate poverty and malnourishment? It, our our uh, civilization began with uh, food and agriculture, and it's going to end with food and agriculture unless we address it correctly. So wh what is the reason some of the problems we see is in agriculture we have short-term surplus and long-term shortage of commodities. You go in many parts of the world, we produce a lot of food, but we do not know how to use them at times. Here is a, you know, Potato farmers growing so much potatoes, they do not know what to do. They dump it on the on, on, on highways to get the attention of the government that something needs to be done. You can look at this. Then, uh, 15 to 20 percent of the produce that's that's uh, you know um, that the small farmers make, they are wasted or they are exposed to conditions where their utilization is very minimum. So, if you look at the challenge number one, is therefore how can we integrate? small holder farmers into value chain? This is a very key question. How we, do we integrate that so that they get the best return on their investment and also creates more job for them? So they do not depend only on production agriculture, but what to do with whatever they have produced. So if you look at fruits and vegetable industry, for example, in many parts of the world you go and you'll see one recurring statement that we need lack of support and availability of cold chain impedes fruits and vegetable industry growth, which is probably correct. But let's diagnose that a little bit more, is that, you know, again, you'll see high operating costs makes uh, setting up cold chain difficult and unviable. Another statement, you'll see cold storage facilities in India, for example, are available only for 10% of the produce, majority of which is used by potatoes. And these are the correct statements. So therefore, they're pushing the government. We need coal chain. And government has agreed to put in a lot of money to create new coal chain. So the, my question is, is that the right policy? The reason I say that is because if you look at another example of um, another milk union limited, this is a cooperative which deals with milk and milk products only. If you go and analyze this, you'll see that even landless farmers with less than, you know, couple cows, one or two buffaloes that, 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 that belong to them, if you, t if you analyze that, you'll see they milk and walk about almost a kilometer and stand in line and sell their milk, which is collected. A refrigerated truck comes in, and it takes to a processing facility, and a lot of food products come out. Now, milk is 10 times more temperature sensitive than any fruits and vegetables. But these guys did not wait for government to establish cold chain for them to take care of milk. They created a market-driven economy. They created product, and it became like a, a suction effect, and everything in, fell in line. So therefore, we have to do something very similar to fruits and vegetables, but there are reasons why it has not happened. It's not a rocket science, but again, if you look at uh, fruits and vegetable industry, you will see there are different reasons why the same thing cannot be replicated. So this Ananda Milk Union Limited is owned by more than 3 million farmers, and its annual revenue is about three, $2 billion. If you look at the fruits and vegetable industry, we talk about it. You read the papers, you'll say, we'll produce, and we'll go, and we'll market it. But there's an ocean of activities that have to be in place before that can happen. And for those kinds of things to happen, we need some preservation technology, we need value addition technology, we need distribution system, and above all, job creation and economic empowerment through agriculture is often not emphasized enough. That agriculture we have produced, this is raw material, this is source for income, where there are many things that can be done, food and non-food uses of agriculture to really empower the farmers, not only get more money for their product or their produce, but also as a source of income by non-food related activities. So how do you do this? If you look at, for example, from Fargate to Marketplace, and we talked about some of it this morning, uh, if you look at the number of steps, we talked about, you know, we heard it that we need more roads. But roads and infrastructure is one of the things that, it, that are needed, but you know, many things like quantity versus quality, market intelligence, state-of-the-art technology, harmonized standards, 
regulations, trained manpower, science and engineering technology centers and incubators, capital, infrastructure. These are all interlinked activities that are necessary in order to take from farm gate to the marketplace. In the US, it's very interesting if you look at it, farming is less than 1% of GDP, but if you add all the you know, fruit and fiber industry, it becomes about 10 to 12% of $16 trillion economy, which is a big multiplier, where you can use the food and agriculture as a source for generating income. So why this does not happen? Because there are some missing, very important, crucial links that are not paid attention to, and the most important is quantity versus quality. We have a lot of quantity, but a variable quality. And that does not lend itself to economy of scale. When we talk about economy of scale, it's not, we are talk, not talking about multi-billion pound economy. We are talking about few hundred thousand kilogram economy of scale that can benefit the farmers who produce them. The reason it doesn't happen is because if you look at the land holding side, size, in India, it's about 1.6 hectares. USA is about 160 acres, 100 times more. So what happens is when farmers produce, every farmer is producing, for example, a different kinds of potato. Some potatoes have high sugar, some potatoes have low sugar. You turn, make French fries, you'll turn brown, the other one will be still green. The same thing with the, with, the, uh, with, the, with the tomatoes. You cannot have green tomatoes and ri ripe tomatoes all put together, junk in and junk out. So therefore, there is, has to be a way to have a large quantity of defined quality so you can make economy of scale and make good quality product day in and day out. Even if you do that, sometimes it does not happen because many people have tried this through contract farming, for example. If you look at uh, solutions, people have tried contract farming. But contract farming, again, multinationals go for contract farming and there, Again, they do not touch it with a 10-foot pole unless it's a multi, multi-million dollar undertaking. So when I was at the State Department, we worked on an idea of using a small and medium-sized enterprises to go and work with the regional, smaller-scale farmers where we can bring some economy of scale. And uh, then the third idea is a producer company. Now the government of India, for example, has started how farmers can come together and form companies of their own similar to Amul, but farmers are not technologists, they are not engineers, they are not business people. They need somebody who can test, take their produce, first of all, work with them so that everybody grows, if they grow potatoes, they grow the same variety of potato. So that brings economy of scale. Then the next st step will be how to take that and make into valuable products. And that uh, you know, producer company idea is being pursued and several um, efforts are underway. So if you challenge number two, we also touched something you know, on, on malnutrition and worldwide. We know that 870 million uh, people suffer from caloric deficiencies. Two billion people suffer from micronutrient deficiencies such as iron, zinc, iodine, vitamin A. One in four children under five is underweight and half of them live in just three countries, India, Bangladesh, and Pakistan and we have to address this issue. So what has uh, happened is now, as also was mentioned earlier, these are some of the same generic things that I'm stating, but look at some of the solutions. Farm products are moving away, our consumers are moving for, away from farms. And the distance, both in time and both in place, they're they are farther apart, and as uh, Chris mentioned, we are at the tipping point where more people are living in uh, urban areas than in rural areas. So how we are going to feed these kinds of people who are either living in shanty town or metropolis, multi-million um, you know, population you know, density cities. So for these kinds of things we need to, their, their issues are different. If you look at the shanty town, they are worried about survivability, poverty. Their issues are very different than the issues that are faced by people living in metropolitan cities who are with rising income, they are changing their lifestyle, they are demanding more nutrition, and they are you know, making healthy choices, and they can afford it, and they are also concerned about safety. So these two issues are not solvable by the same <coughs> approach. There has to be two different track of approach to address these two issues. And there may be something in between. So we have to make some value-added new products 
that take advantage of what we have and cater to the need of these two different set of uh, populations. So one overlooked strategy to, to address the nutritional affordability and sustainability question. I'll submit to you that one of the ways to do it is actually using underutilized or orphan crops. Orphan crops are some such things like sorghum, various millets, cowpeas, horse gram, cassava, yams, etc., etc., etc. There are a lot of them in the world. The unique thing about them is they require minimum inputs in terms of water and fertilizer, best suited for climate change. They're nutritionally superior but not attractive to industry, have low market value because we do not know how to utilize them in food formulations. And they receive little scientific attention or, or funding despite their significance for food security in the world and in the poorest region of the world. So how, what we can do is, if you look at the worldwide consumption of calories, 75% of the calories come from these four crops. Corn, rice, soy, and wheat. Are these sustainable? Should we push these four crops throughout the world? Or should we complement them with these underdeveloped or underutilized crops such as millets, legumes, algae, and all sorts of other underutilized crops, complement them with the main staple crop and create, with the help of food science and technology and using state-of-the-art technologies, use nutritious and safe food and therefore create a suction effect so that these things start making sense. The, the, you know, the, um, the legumes and millets, which are kind of neglected, neglected crops, if we create a market for them, they will be very advantageous both to the growers and the users. And I'm also mentioning that we should create nutritious, safe food, but also not forget that we can also make byproducts and derivatives a bunch of them at some food processing system that can also fetch money to the producer and the processor. So in summary, I'll say that increasing, I'm repeating this, I've said this many, many times to my international agriculture and rural development class, is what uh, Professor per Penstrup Anderson said, is you know, increasing productivity is necessary but not sufficient to capture and maximize all the benefits from agricultural enterprises. Development in food and agro-processing industry must occur in tandem with production. It should not be one-sided. They should go hand in hand. Integration of orphan crops via processing to create new market for tasty, nutritious, and reasonably priced food needs to be pursued. Of course, science is invariably necessary, but cannot solve every problem. National policy matters. So all the policies that government have in place need to look at what is strategy is best for each country, and that is to be the future that will lead to a better future. Thank you very much for your time. One of the things that comes through uh, to me and everyone's, in one way or another, in each uh, of your presentations is this heterogeneity question, that uh, understanding that blanket solutions aren't going to work, uh, that you know, certainly some things, some solutions are going to be large scale and, and easily scalable, but maybe most aren't. How, there are more problems, challenges, specific local realities than there are um, PhD researchers. How, how do you deal with that heter uh, heterogeneity scientifically? I don't know who wants to begin with that? But how do you how, how do you come how do you how do you wrestle with that? the fact that the world is so varied and needs such different things in different places. I can start, um, and then Rebecca can tear me to shreds. Um, <laughs> uh, well, I think uh, Rebecca mentioned the, the buzzword precision agriculture, um, and uh, so that's a scientifically driven uh, initiative to understand the interactions of I take the example of nutrient additions and crop growth with different climates and uh, crops and um, and soil fertility status, um, and and you can plug that in uh, and and 
most of you might know these kind of systems that can even go to the level of detail that you have a, a measurement device at the front end of your, uh, your tractor and then that uh, establishes what your, your uh, soil fertility uh, management needs are and at the back end uh, it doses the nitrogen and phosphorus and potassium what have you uh, additions according to the measurements at the front end. Um, it can go to that level, um, but there are there are numerous opportunities that we have to um, uh, leverage, and I I think there's there's an interesting discussion to be had uh, with Rebecca um, about about the indigenous knowledge and the indigenous or the the, the farmer driven uh, innovation and research on his or her own farm uh, versus the knowledge that's brought in, and I'm I'm very interested in that. Um, how much should you bring in, and how much exploration does the farmer uh, herself do and and that's that's a, a challenge um, to not be locked into a local optimum that maybe the farmer can explore but bringing in adequate and and good information at the level that the farmer can then explore a global uh, optimum maybe we'll take that up I don't feel inclined to shred you in any way, to be honest, but I, I, I want to make the distinction between high-tech precision agriculture, which I understand has not been as resoundingly embraced by high-tech producers, I think because there just isn't enough variability to capitalize on in, I mean, although you wouldn't think so if you looked at my cornfield up at Aurora, I mean, I, I think I'd make good money doing that, but uh, I think if you look at the heterogeneity of, you know, of African agriculture, having low-tech sort of uh, precision agriculture via empowerment of farmers that, I mean, respects their already quite precise knowledge of their situation, but brings in that global knowledge to further um, uh, give them alternatives to, to, to utilize in their farm management. I think there probably would be, I mean, I'm, very, I'm, I'm trying, I have uh, tried to support a PhD studentship to look at the, you know, what is the potential value of um, more precisely meeting the needs of, uh, of farms across parameter space. What, what would be the economic benefit of getting it right locally as opposed to pursuing a, a uniform recommendation over space? And of course, nobody, nobody does honor those blanket recommendations. Obviously, that would be beyond absurd in any farmer's mind. But, um, but if we were actually to support an active attempt at local, locally optimized, and I think that would have to include size idea of using um, local crops, you, you know, using a broader diversity of crops and a broader diversity of opportunities. I think I think that benefit could be significant. I'd like to hear what Chris has to say about that. Actually, yeah. Well, the the core I think here is is people, and I I think that the central answer is education and extension. Because it's not indigenous knowledge or scientist-generated knowledge coming out of major research centers. It's the union of the two. It's farmers who can diagnose what's going on in their local context, who can identify where do I source the information that can address my current limiting constraints, or how do I identify the constraints that scientists just aren't paying attention to and feed that information back up so that clever people sitting at Cornell and elsewhere come up with the new scientific breakthroughs that they need. And so I, I, I think that it's important to recognize that parallel to the challenges we face in agricultural research and broader food systems innovation, taking into account post-harvest systems that Sai is going to remind us of if I forget to, we, we're staring at a serious breakdown in the educational systems, especially the tertiary education systems and the research systems and the extension systems in Africa and Asia. It's not uniform, but the places that we're struggling most are the places that are having the greatest difficulty right now in, in building a well-educated and reasonably information accessible workforce in agriculture and broader post-harvest food systems. And if we fail to build the human capacity in these systems, it doesn't matter how much clever science we generate here, it's just not going to get taken up very quickly and very effectively. Uh, let me follow up on that thought with the workforce and, and people working in uh, food production being so important, obviously, to the, the global goals that people have. Um, Mike mentioned it in his presentation, and uh, also uh, Sai, I believe, that the, so many people are moving out of agriculture. Um, what do you foresee uh, as, the, as the future of, of that, as the uh, rural economies really change? Is it 
is there a hunt on for more efficient systems that, that fewer numbers of people can manage or, um, or ways to rope people back into agriculture? I'm, I'm curious about this question of who's going who's gonna to produce the food of the future. Go ahead, please. So it's important to recognize why do you have decreasing shares of population economically active in agriculture? And that's a, a consequence of productivity growth. You know, the, the confluence that, that Sai showed us that the hungry parts of the world are the places where most people are working in agriculture, that's because they're unproductive in their agriculture, unfortunately. And so they remain heavily engaged in agriculture. It's an empirical regularity across the world and across history that as agricultural labor productivity grows, incomes increase, the need for more people in agriculture is diminishing and people exit agriculture. I mean, most small farmers aren't looking for their kids to continue their farms, certainly not all of their kids. They're looking to educate their children and have them graduate out of primary production into more comfortable, easier jobs, frankly, the ones we've got than the ones they've got. And so the, the exit of people from agriculture, the orderly exit of people from agriculture is desirable. It's a manifestation that we're making progress. The trick is when people are getting flushed out of the system, it's not orderly. They're being dispossessed of their land and they're simply having to leave because the soils are so degraded that it's not worth cultivating and they move to shanty towns. So the, the, I think we need to worry less about the shrinking s size of the economically active population in agriculture and worry much more about the productivity of those in agriculture, their labor productivity. Shrinking size of the farm. I'll let go and then I have a comment. Okay. Um, in my opinion, you know, the more people involved in agriculture need to get out of production agriculture and use that agriculture as a raw material to create newer and you know food and non-food products not necessarily just food but ag agro business industry we have not we have used agriculture only as a source of calorie or food it's not looked upon as a source of business if you look in this country you know it's the largest employer is the food and fiber industry 25 million people work in, in the US in food and fiber industry after the farm gate and it multiplied effect of, in terms of job and in terms of addition to GDP is tremendous. Not many countries look at that, that bring those people, create some kind of infrastructure or business opportunity for them to b benefit from. Not from production, but what to do, what to do with that pro produced product and how to use that in, in making novel and new products for food and non-food uses. I have a different perspective since I'm a dairy guy, <clears throat> I would, who, who milks the cows in New York State? Are they New York State residents? Mm -mm. I think that's really fascinating because it seems like every time, to Chris's point, every time we elevate and we increase productivity, the, the indigenous folks don't want to do the work anymore. And I can go everywhere in the world, if I go to Italy, most of those cows are being milked by people from India or Poland or Tunisia. If I go to Germany, they're Poles. If I go to France, I don't, I'm not really sure where those are coming from. But the, the point is, is that everywhere I go, you know, who picks our apples and who does our vegetables? So I find this uh, rather troubling because those people are really hard to educate, yet they're the ones that are on the ground every day doing the work and trying to implement some of the science that we all try to come up with. And it doesn't really matter what area of food production we look at, somebody else is doing that work day in and day out. We're hoping that whoever supervises them or manages them is taking the time, which I know isn't really happening, to educate them, to bring them along. They might do a good job of getting them set up on an SOP, but other than that, there's really not much beyond that. I think that, to me, is a real risk as we look at food security around the world uh, because we, we don't spend a lot of time helping those people understand why they're doing it. They just fill a spot until they either make enough money that they go home or, or something else happens. Uh, I have a, a question or two before I'd um, love to open it up to, uh, to the floor. Uh, seeing all of you here you know, selected because you're representing different disciplines uh, makes me think about the challenge of working across disciplinary boundaries and anyone who's spent more than 
half an hour out in, <laughs> out in the world knows that the world doesn't divide up into academic departments. Uh, how do you coordinate research on, you know, how, how two, a two-part question. One is how does the, the fruits of your research get into the world and how do you coordinate with, with one another to make sure that you're not stepping on each other's toes or negating each other's work or that you're, you're building on that complexity? I can start and then <laughs> uh, can chime in. Um, I, I, one of my first months actually here at Cornell, um, I was asked by Alice Pell and, and Chris Barrett um, to join in a bid to the National Science Foundation's Biocomplexity Grant. And that was, that was wonderful, uh, first of all, because these are excellent scientists and, and great people to work with, but also um, because it was a highly complex uh, multidisciplinary um, and interdisciplinary project. Um, but then, of course, now we debated aggregates and it means something completely different to Chris uh, than to me as a soil scientist. And, uh, and so we, we, we uh, uh, um, take these, these language hurdles first um, and uh, it, but but there are much more than these language hurdles. I, th I think they're they're real hurdles, um, but they're uh, it's, uh, they're rewarding to take these hurdles. Uh, but taking them to, to the end, uh, to a product, is, is uh, not very easy. Um, and um, I, I could, of course, always criticize funding sources um, that rarely allow those interdisciplinary uh, projects to, to take to the, to the full end. Um, but, but also the, the reward system in, in our uh, publication and, and in our promotion um, uh, system and, and uh, that that challenges this um, interdisciplinary uh, research. How we bring it out to people uh, through, um, I, I think increasingly through these knowledge products, um, and I, I really like the the effort um, of of AFSIS and and um, uh, the the uh, global. Um, soil partnerships that trying to bring uh, to bring uh, multiple perspectives to um, to the international research centers and then to to the farmers but the the weak link is is the extension services I think in many of the countries as as Chris mentioned and and that's something that's very removed from our work um, but I personally, I'm very keen on it. Uh, we, what we could do, and I think Cornell, as a as a land grant and um, declared world university, uh, could could have these uh, extension professors that are actually extension professors for international agriculture that are are uh, internationally uh, going to farmers uh, and work internationally with farmers and with extension services to build them up uh, overseas, not just here in New York State. As food science, we are actually equal opportunity researchers. We collaborate with animal science, dairy food's a big part of our program. We collaborate with the plant science people because they have, we make the products that people eat. We um, work with economists because ultimately it is the economic system, money is the business and is what happens, how it, uh, you know, we deal with the you know, marketing of the product we create. Uh, we work with the, you know soil scientists how to uh, enrich the soil from waste material coming out of food processing. So we really are at the centerpiece. We interact with everybody in the college. I also wanted to pick up on that issue of extension and how, you know how we, in principle, we as researchers, uh, in, in a, a certain view of extension. Uh, sorry, a certain view of how causality occurs in agriculture, we, we get the results and then extension takes it to farmers. And that, that model just does not have a lot of credibility, actually, to me or to a lot of people for a long time. And, and this idea of how to really bring local knowledge and global knowledge together effectively it remains a big challenge in spite of that critique being quite long standing. But I spent some years working in farmer field school sorts of settings. Um, and felt the potential research power of a democratized sort of science. And I still feel that if we were able to take that forward in, a, in a, the way that modern information science allows us to, we, there, is a, there is a possibility of a new way of thinking of extension that's more of a, 
a, a really effective two-way link between the research process and the farming process. Because you can, if we were able to really link global principles with local experimentation on a vast scale, there could be the, a big data source for, for understanding agriculture that would be a lot better than what I currently have. My experimental capability now is extremely limited, but if I were able to be linked to a more democratized research process, my potential for understanding biological interactions of interest to me, those genetics by environment, by, by uh, management, by social processes would be so much more powerful. So I feel that if we are able to have the imagination to re-envision the challenge of extension to be much more muscular, much more multi-directional, actually our ability as scholars to understand the processes underlying production, nutrition, transformation would be so much more. So I think we have to, I think we have to be more imaginative and how we envision. That word is so inadequate. We don't even have vocabulary for a new idea of extension. I mean, please give me one. But I hate that word because it so implies a linear one-way process that I know and she's going to do what I say. That's actually still the functioning assumption of many people. And it's so un uninspiring to me. So anyway, I think we can do better. <laughs> uh, folks have questions. And there are, oh, a lot. Wow. I thought I was the only one. I've got more. Uh, yeah, so I don't know where to begin. Uh, the first hand I saw there was uh, Randy Barker, right behind you. Sorry. Um, uh, first, I wanted to mention that as a, coming to Cornell as an undergraduate, I had to milk cows for six months just to get in. <laughs> that was a couple of years ago, so you know I'm not. I would like to put a footnote on what Chris has said about water. You see, water resource management isn't one of those kingdoms up there because we don't have a kingdom in water management, partly because it's interdisciplinary. Now, uh, the problem is this. Uh, in water resource management in Ithaca, New York, of course, is keeping water out of your basement. But water resource management in the U.S. is becoming a critical problem. Uh, and, and in Africa and, and, and uh, Asia as well. Consider the U.S. Uh, the Oglala watershed uh, is dropping, is being mined. Uh, the breadbasket, one of the world's breadbaskets, is under threat. And uh, back in what Pedro calls the good old days, Cornell and Utah State and Colorado State trained a generation of people in water management. We taught a course for 10 to 15 years, and I say we, myself, Bill Levine, and Walt, uh, and some other people and so forth in engineering. For 10 to 15 years, we taught an interdisciplinary course in water management, where we met once a week, four of us, professors every week, to talk to each other about water management. That's all gone. Uh, and uh, Chris, I was out in, Logan, Utah, a couple of weeks ago. That's a territory that you know well. And I talked to Jack and Andy Keller, and I said, what's going on now here in water management? They said, well, the Utah State hasn't hired anybody in water management in decades. So we've got to start somewhere and start thinking about what Chris has identified correctly as, I think, the real resource constraint that we're facing. And, and I don't know where you begin, but I, I guess there's an empty space at Cornell, and I don't see any opportunity that would like you to fill it, because you people are all wanting to fill your own. And, uh, <laughs> and, and uh, as I say, uh, being an interdisciplinarian, I mean, you know, it, it's too complicated for economic economists. They don't want to get into something like that. It's, you have to know too much. So, uh, <laughs> you know, exactly. uh, that's the problem. Anyway, thank you. Does anyone want to respond to that or? Someone's got the mic there. Oh, microphone in the back. Not a response, but uh, what's the potential for providing education through the electronic media in Africa and Asia? Single word answer, tremendous. There's already uh, a small 
peer-reviewed literature emerging from people running experiments on using ICTs, primarily cell phone, not necessarily even smartphone, just cell phone technology, SMS messaging, et cetera, for delivering everything from soils recommendations on soil nutrient replenishment to uh, market information so that people can time sales and purchases properly. And the productivity growth associated with that very simple messaging using existing technologies is really quite substantial. It's, it's on the order of magnitude of varietal improvements that we get. ICT can have a huge effect. One of the classic examples is a, a very nice study done in coastal India. Farmers, or, sorry, fishermen in coastal India commonly land to catch. Well, it used to be that they just go back to whatever port they came from. But if everybody who lands a catch shows up at the same port with a highly perishable commodity, you know what's going to happen to prices. So these fishermen don't do especially well. But with cell phones, as soon as cell phones began to arrive in the area, they carefully choose the port for which there was inadequate supply and ample demand for the particular species of fish they just landed. And the average increase in, in fishermen profits in the course of a single year was on the order of 45%. That's huge for relatively small fishermen. The gains you get from ICT for small farmers and small fishermen and herders is tremendous. We don't exploit it nearly enough yet. Uh, Jonathan? Mm -hmm. uh, no, Pedro, next, uh, your, your neighbor? Oh, I didn't have a microphone. Oh, does someone have a microphone? Um, I like the gentleman's point here, but I also liked Rebecca's about uh, education being a two-way thing. And maybe the, the person we need to read is Paolo Freire, if that's the right pronunciation. Pedro? Yeah, Pedro, would you like to? Okay. I will say. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, first, let me say I really enjoy this panel of five signs. This is very, very refreshing and uh, uh, I learned a few I learned a few things in the process. I, I love the, the idea. Um, I have some comments. Uh, first to, to to I have one comment to, to Chris Barrett's uh, presentation. Um, <clears throat> even though I, uh, I I get so interdisciplinary that I confuse Chris with uh, Johannes Lennon. Thank you for producing a fantastic soil scientist that we just hired. But, uh, but you produced uh, two excellent ag, ag economists, which you, we just hired too. But my point is this. I think we have to take a look at this business of new lands for agriculture. Our mantra that everything has to go through intensification, and I was the first one that said double, triple yields. That's it, intensification. The mantra of that, I think we uh, deserve scrutiny because there are large areas uh, in South America and Africa that are not uh, environmentally viable, usually degraded pastures and stuff like that, uh, that could be transformed into, into large-scale agriculture. There's some huge dangers in Africa with that, with the land grabs, uh, that are happening, and, and that's, a, that's a major constraint. Uh, still huge possibilities in South America, enormous possibilities, without touching the Amazon or any environmentally, environmentally sensitive, sensitive areas, usually using the, either the uh, uh, forest fallows or, or the uh, or degraded pastures. Uh, now that we're about to have, you mentioned AFSIS, the uh, digital soil map of Africa, we're about to have the first digital soil map of Africa in, in the next uh, few months at a very nice scale, uh, 100 meters by 100 meters, that's a hectare. Uh, we might be able to figure out where they are. I've seen the Serato, the African Serato, many, many times. It's all in Southern Africa, same latitude as Brasilia. Um, now that we're also working with the Brazilians on the digital soil map, maybe we can get a few things together and figure out where things are. But it's, uh, I don't want to exclude it anymore, Chris. Our mantra is that everything has to be yield increases. Yes, but not everything. There is that, that potential too. And, and my second comment is, is to Mike. 
uh, that uh, maybe I spoke too fast, but I was saying you don't need to triple food crop yields. And then I also meant, I didn't say so, but I, I also meant livestock yields, I also meant uh, tree yields. And in the Millennium Villages projects, uh, farmers in the past release areas have been able, because of some interventions, to indeed triple cattle milk yields. And in, in, in Ghana, uh, cocoa farmers have also tripled cocoa yields on a protective basis. So I think it's a general idea, uh, especially at this low level, that you could really, really triple yields. Uh, the, uh, my, my, uh, my real problem with, uh, with what's going on in livestock production uh, in the world is this uh, capital system, fine animal uh, feeding operations or feedlots in the U.S. and other developed countries. I, I love ruminant animals, even though I only took one course, feeds and feeding at Cornell, but I, I was uh, then you know, 15 years later placed as the leader of a beef production program at CIAS even though I'm a soul science. And uh, I, I was actually asked by Science Magazine uh, to put together a policy forum on, on, the, uh, on the confined animal feeding operations. And we went through, we had people from all over the world involved in that, saying, my God, you know, so bad to prostitute the, uh, the room in an animal and made it into a monogastric that is basically only eating corn and soybeans in, in a good chunk of their lives and, uh, and, and, and so on. We had all the arguments until we got to economic spheres. And, and then the paper fell apart because this confined animal feeding operations are extremely profitable. Now they're very bad for, for everything else for the environment, for our arteries, cholesterol, so on, so on, so on. But <laughs> they're, they're extremely profitable, so we just drop the paper. Um, I still think I'm a carnivore, and uh, I, I love to see, I love to eat good beef. Uh, I mean, sorry, uh, grass, grass-fed um, steaks. And when I go to land in Africa, in a place like Senegal, that's about the first thing that I asked for. Uh, and, uh, <clears throat> and, but I don't know what, I mean, if there's any possibility of frankly coming into our senses in, in letting the ruminant animal be, uh, be there, uh, do, do its thing, as you say, using land that, that cannot be used for crop production and, and, and so on. So that's my question to you. And then, then a comment. Uh, Thank goodness we're dealing with agriculture from a nutritional point of view, too. And I was told by, by nutritionists in Ghana, I have a lot of respect, that uh, babies after weaning, toddlers or whatever they may be, really need to eat some sort of meat uh, in order to have enough iron in their little stomachs. And, and other, uh, other, uh, other foods cannot provide that. So if you want to try to raise your baby as a vegetarian after weaning, you're, uh, I think you're going to hurt that. We have to realize that there is an important uh, part of milk, a <coughs> part of uh, uh, meat in our, in our diet, and, and, uh, very much so. Okay. And what you said about who's milking the cows and, and collecting the uh, apples and, and all this stuff, it goes to the immigration reform. <laughs> Mike, do you want to quickly respond to any of that? Yeah, so the, yeah, I don't, I'll get myself in trouble here. So, so the only, well, I'll agree with everything. The, the feedlot is a hard one, you know. So the U.S. feedlot's a really interesting example. For a little over half, maybe three quarters of the life, they spend their time on grass, right, because it still is a cow-calf operation. But then, you know, it, but, it, you know, and it wasn't such a big deal we didn't really think about it that much until we started this ethanol mandate. And when grain went to six, it went from two fifty a bushel corn to six or seven dollars or eight dollars a bushel. Now all of a sudden, we got a whole another problem. Now, of course, we've adapted, so we're spending lots of distillers to these guys because <laughs> you got to get rid of that somehow. So, so there's that's probably again, it's back to resource allocation. But I, I would agree with you at some level there's probably a limit to how much we can afford to do that equitably 
and environmentally, it's a lot of resource input for, for beef. But I still don't know, you know, I'm a cow guy, I'm still trying to figure this out, because you're right, in the end they still make money. And, and that's, and they still feed people. Now we just have to decide that it's not the, maybe it's not the best resource allocation. So I agree with that part. Uh, Ronnie Kaufman has a comment? Yeah, I was just gonna, my opinion is that what's gonna happen with the food system depends a lot on young people. And I think there are more than just productivity gains that are influencing young people. I mean, aren't they really influenced by the revolution in communications? And they just, I mean, they don't know where they're going. They're just leaving, as the old song says. They're leaving the farm. And then there are these people coming in. You can call them land grabbers, or, or they're, 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 they're just really, in many cases, capable production companies. And they're willing to lease the land. It's, it's, it's default sort of consolidation. They lease the, it's going on in South Asia all over. Uh, and they give a much greater return to the landlords who are mostly absent. So you've got young people leaving because they don't like the work, and then you've got these efficient mechanized operations coming in who are glad to consolidate. So it seems to me there's, I have the perception that that's really a powerful complementary force of what's happening, but I'm not sure. Any opinions about that? Anyone want to comment on that? I mean, one kingdom we're missing here are the sociologists and demographers. We <laughs> yeah, they wouldn't return emails. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in black I here. Oh, sorry, she said that microphone. Why don't we yeah, um, the next? I, I, um, I'm sorry? Yeah, and after can you, the I yeah, um, I just wanted to piggyback, if, if I can, um, I wanted to mention, uh, s express a couple of thoughts. Uh, one, I wanted to piggyback on the last session uh, where the moderator, John, uh, you talked about um, the P you know, doing the PBS special on 9 million people and how GMO, the issue of GMO is very difficult. And um, that's one of my biggest concerns, where the GMO issue is going, and that ties into everything else that we are talking about here. Uh, things are moving very fast, as we see how technology is moving at such a fast pace, we can't keep up with it. And I see a lot of inequities in, in the food issue, okay, as well as many issues, and that's because of globalization. Globalization is moving very fast, and countries don't really have a say in it. I've been to many conferences up here up at Cornell to know these things, especially Africa, where there's a huge land grab, where indigenous people in Africa who have little plots of land, who know how to manage their land, or same thing in Mexico, are driven off their land by large landowners, okay? Now, you're nodding your head up front. Maybe that's not happening everywhere. Not the gentleman in the front there. But that is happening. I mean, I see this in documentaries. I see it at conferences here at Cornell. I see it. I watch a lot of news. I tune into PBS, uh, BBC, you know, uh, alternative programs. So anyway, um, I, I think that we're not giving people choices. We're talking about having this modern technology well, we also have traditional farming where people are losing their seed because of genetically engineered technology that's being forced on them. So that's a real ethical concern. And, and like it was just said, we don't have a sociologist on the panel. That's, that's, that's a moral issue, okay? So there, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of issues here. But um, I would like, John, if you can mention, uh, talk about very quickly as to why the PBS News Hour doesn't entertain. It's a complex issue, but we need, we're talking about education here. That's why we're here. We're here to educate ourselves and, and the world. So the, the, the GMO technology is out there. We're consuming GMO products without our knowledge. So, so this, this has to be on the frontier of news and education. And your wife, who's next to you, mentioned a corn 
farm project in Aurora. So I would like if you could elaborate, like what are you, what, what is that about? Are you using GMOs? How, what kind of experiment is going on with that? So if, if you have any, if you, both of you could answer that, and anybody else on the panel could speak on the issue of, you know, the right of a farmer being imposed upon, or, or a country even, being told, well, we have these technologies that are coming from the West, okay, and, so. and this is the way you need to do it. Thank you. Thanks. I'm sorry yeah. it took so long. <laughs> okay, yeah, we do just have a couple of minutes left, and there were a lot of people with, with their hands up in the air. So uh, I would rather not answer in this panel. Uh, I can say I don't know how PBS NewsHour has handled the, the GMO issue um, outside of the, I mean, I, I don't work for them, so I, I, I don't know. Uh, does anyone want to take on any of the issues that, that she raised? Uh, hand in the middle, please. Yes. Oh, sorry. Oh, I said you were next. I'm sorry, I broke my promise. Sorry, here. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I am Hans Rifolo from Morocco. So my question has to do with uh, agriculture and uh, food. Uh, in Morocco and uh, in general in uh, most of uh, countries in Africa, uh, there is a, a huge uh, uh, gap between uh, private and, uh, and, uh, and public uh, sector. Uh, and as I hear from your presentation, the work has to start uh, from the local, uh, local level. Uh, because they have uh, details, uh, knowledge about their, uh, their, their, their context. So in Morocco, for instance, uh, the private sector uh, is growing, and uh, they, they, their goals, uh, most of them, their goals is to produce and to export uh, their products. But uh, their contribution uh, in terms of, uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, water management, uh, uh, soil management, uh, or uh, the priority uh, of our agriculture in, in the country is limited. So uh, my question is, uh, 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 we are uh, we are in the right uh, right way, or uh, because there is no no balance between uh, private and uh, and, uh, and public uh, in public sector in, in terms of agriculture in my country. So uh, are we taking the right way, or maybe something we we should uh, do something for? Does anyone? I Talking about the balance between public and private. Uh, does that because the, 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 uh, there is no, uh, no, uh, no balance between the public and, uh, and the private sector, and the private sector is, is taking advantage uh, from the, 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 the financial support from the government, uh, and uh, we don't know exactly where we are going to. Anyone? Morocco? No, no, no. Um, no takers. So yes, and this will have to be the according to my watch. Am I right? Uh, Fifty yeah. years ago, when IPCAL started, we had a great deal of emphasis on institutions. We felt that if we could help third world institutions develop, they could train their own, they could do their own research, and they could do their own extension. Funding agencies bought this. Ford Foundation put a lot of money into this. AID did for quite a while. And then suddenly, around the 1980s, it all dropped off the map. The whole panel made a big, a great deal of emphasis to localization. These are local issues. They can't be solved with one big solution. We must look at it locally, from soils to, to, to uh, economics. The whole, the whole range of discussion. Only Rebecca mentioned extension. I think Chris had a slight emphasis on extension as well. But I would like, we train a lot of international students here at PhD level. They go back to these institutions in their country and they're not being supported. Most of us who travel abroad know that they're underfunded. They do duplicative research. They have very little connection with others. That extension and research don't talk to each other. That universities which do research don't link to national research programs. 
and we think we can sit here and solve their problems. You said we couldn't, but we really need to get back into the business of helping, develop, helping them develop their institutions so that they can solve their problems and work with local farmers and get that feedback that Rebecca was talking about. And I wonder if you have any comments on that. I have one real quick one. I've done a little bit of that with uh, some colleagues from China. And uh, they've come here and they want to they wanna learn to be preeminent scientists and go back and write really high level research papers. And I keep telling them, you, you can do some of that, but what you re also got to do is you got to go home and you've got to transfer that knowledge to the people that are in the field so you can actually do something with it. And it's a real hard sell. They have very little interest in wanting to go out and engage the guys in the field. They just want to write papers and come to scientific meetings and look like, hey, see, we see how much we've grown. Uh, I've gotten one out of about ten that actually wants to engage people who are involved in in production agriculture, which is okay, but it's not as good as it could be. So I, I don't know how to change that, and that's also where the money comes from. They get rewarded for being scientists, not for going out and engaging the industry. So that's. That reward system has to change or there has to be another mechanism. I, I take your point. Do you want to talk about that, Rebecca, at all? Well, just to, uh, just to point out that that's an institutional problem. And so I think that just backs up your point that we have to understand how, how agriculture works, how the real world works, but also how the institutional interface with it works, whether it's dysfunctional. So we need to get the diagnoses right and address them. And I do think that's part of the project, certainly. Great. Well, I want to thank. Wait, there's one more person oh, that sorry. has a an urgency who's got a, oh, a microphone yeah sorry he got uh, promised oh you <laughs> i make calls like this um i want to pick up on the topic of waste and chris quite early on suggested that there's a very little opportunity for reducing waste but with 30 to 50 percent of food wasted before well after market and development developed well not before market and development well. we've had other panelists talking about opportunities for recycling waste back into either animal production or into soils we've had um, we've heard about how we can improve value chain supplies and refrigeration to think of reduce waste in other situations. Is it really as depressing as you make out that we can't make any <laughs> inroads into that 30 to 50 percent of food that's wasted? So, my core quarrel is with the 30 to 50 percent claim. Look hard at where those numbers are coming from, they're very fragile foundations. We're only just starting to see people going out and do very careful tracking from farmers' fields through to people's kitchens to see where the waste is occurring in the developing world. And the few preliminary findings that I've seen, and I emphasize they're preliminary, find far lower numbers than the sorts of things you find in these big meta studies coming out of FAO and a few other sources. And when you start tracing the footnotes, you find that there isn't a primary data source behind any of it. It starts with someone's conjecture, somebody asking some expert, well, what do you think it is? And somebody like me just wings it and says, man, eh, 30%. And suddenly this becomes gospel. The, the foundations, the hard primary data empirical foundations for claims about waste in food systems are incredibly thin. And until we firm those up, I'd be very reluctant about betting much on waste reduction. And I, here, let me emphasize edible product waste reduction. And I distinguish between the inedible recycling, the sorts of things that Mike is talking about, or Johannes is engaged in very creative projects to take the biomass that humans aren't going to eat or the bone products from slaughterhouses and recycling those in ways that add value and increase productivity. That's a different matter, and I think there's a lot of potential there. But the hypothesis that there's a lot of edible food out there right now, especially in the developing world, that can be readily captured and we can use that as a means of, of filling that wedge between where we are today and the, and the demand growth, I think that's a, that's a lot of speculative claims that I'm very reluctant. I hope that there is some truth to that, that we really can squeeze a lot of waste out of the system, but I, I increasingly doubt that it's there, frankly. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks for coming. Thanks to the panelists. Thanks to the organizers.